All right, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read a few verses here from this famous chapter, well-known chapter. This has what people call the Beatitudes. I don't know where that comes from but because that word's not in the Bible. But <laughs> So, some beautiful truths, though, that's for sure. Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to start with verse 43. We're not, so we're going to bypass all what, what people call the Beatitudes. And we're going to go near the end of the chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 42, and we'll read down to the end, to verse 48. Matthew 5, 42, Jesus is speaking, and he says, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. I want to point out several things here before I get to the main thing. First of all, I want to say that this is a way of living that is so foreign to man so foreign to the nature of man. But I also want to say this, that, that Jesus is not setting aside Old Testament laws and ways of dealing with crime and so forth. That's not what this is about. He's talking to his disciples, and he's telling them how they ought to live given the circumstances that they are under. They're under Roman rule. That's why he says, you know, the three famous things that he mentions here that people have a hard time with and people uh, use and misapply and don't understand. Uh, the three things is, um, is love your enemies. Number two, turn the other cheek. And number three, go the extra mile. All right, we've heard those three illustrations or those statements uh, from this, this passage. If we were started earlier, we would have seen the, those other two that I mentioned. But um, anyway, so, so wh wh when he says when someone compels you to carry something for a mile, he says, go with them twain. Now, wh so who can compel you to carry something? We live in a free country. Nobody can make you do anything. Nobody can make you carry their luggage anywhere. So, because we have freedom. So Jesus is telling us how to live when we don't have freedom. Why do people not have freedom? People don't have freedom. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So when, when, when there's a nation of people that predominantly, or a majority, or at least in, in the old days, uh, people believed in the Lord, had respect for God and His Word, God blesses them with liberty. And we've had a lot of liberty in America. But now we're seeing it go away. And now, more and more, we're getting oppressors coming in where our government is turning into an oppressive government. They're supposed to be public servants, but they're changing. Why? Because we're letting them change. Because we're not paying attention to God. We're not paying. I'm talking about as a whole, as a nation, not individually. But as a nation, we have turned away from God. We've expelled him from our public schools through prayer and Bible and so forth, which I remember when I was a kid, I had a teacher that read the Bible in class. And uh, I was not taught evolution in grade school. Um, I never even heard about evolution, I don't think, until I was in high school. Maybe junior high. I just don't remember much about junior high. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, our nation has gone downhill. And so, um, you know, God says, for the transgression of the land and many of the princes thereof. Princes are wannabe rulers. 
you know, they're going to be king some. They have a chance of being a king someday if uh, another prince dies and they're, they're, the, they're the one in line for the, for the, for the crown or for the throne. But um, so, so that, there's a principle there in Proverbs that when a land gets more and more wicked, God allows more people to rule over the people. And therefore, you have less liberty. Um, so Benjamin Franklin made a statement that's based on that principle because he knew the Bible, you know, fairly well. People knew the Bible more back then better than the average person does today, better than the average Christian does. And he made a statement that when a nation becomes more vile and vicious, they have more need of masters. And that's one of his famous quotes. And that's because of that principle in Proverbs. So anyway, uh, so a lot of people don't understand that turning the other cheek, if they paid attention, they would understand what that means. Because, in fact, I probably should go back and, um, and find that and, uh, and, and show that to you. Uh, let's see. Yeah, look back at verse, uh, verse uh, 39. Look at verse 39 of, of Matthew chapter 5. It says, But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, that's a short statement, but in that statement you see a detail, if you pay attention, that helps you understand. He's not saying anybody that comes up to you and hits you, uh, just turn the other cheek. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about when you have oppressors, like the Jews did. They had the Romans who had conquered them. Because is the, is the average person right-handed or left-handed? The average person is right-handed. There's more right-handed people than, by far than left-handed people. So if a man's going to smite you on the cheek, which cheek is he going to hit? He's going to hit your left. Why? He's right-handed. And, and that's the way people hit if they're going to just come up so if it's talking about someone who's going to come, then Jesus told it wrong. But he didn't tell it wrong. He's talking about oppressors. What do oppressors do? When oppressors, when leaders are going to smite a servant, they don't do it like a brawl, like a fight. No, they do it like a master to, like a uh, superior to an inferior. They backhand them. Hey, do what I told you. Right? And so... And they're right-handed, but they backhand them. So what cheek's it going to land on? It's going to land on the right cheek. Because they're going to smite with the right hand on average. And they're going to backhand you. It's going to land on the right cheek. And so Jesus said, if, if, if a man smite thee on the right cheek, or, let's see, how's it worded? Yeah. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, then who's going to do that? A boss? A master? Someone that, a tyrant? Someone who's over you? Because God has allowed oppression to come because of transgression in the land. So God is saying, don't resist the people that I send to oppress you because of your sin. Because it's my judgment. That would be like resisting God. So God says, turn the other cheek as a sign of submission. Yes, master. Yes, sir. Turn the other cheek. If someone says, hey, carry this here. Why? Because he's your master. He says, carry this a mile. Then and God says, do more than what you have to because they're your tyrant and you're their oppressor. Do more. Show them that you, you care for them. And that leads to verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. See? They're right there. He's telling them what he's talking about. Your enemies, the people from another country have conquered you. Love your enemies. I allowed them to conquer you because you turned away from me. And judgment is here now. And I want you to not resist my punishment, my chastisement. That's the reason for this. God wants us to love him even when he's chastening us. And so... Uh, anyway, but, but this idea that in America, you know, someone smites you turn the other cheek. No. No, we're a free people. You don't do that. If, some, if, if someone abuses you, then you use your freedom and use the powers that we've uh, put in there so we don't act out of passion and have them arrested if they deserve to be arrested.
okay? So use the powers that we have. But if God ever judges America and puts a nation over us, then we should submit. That's why I've said years ago, I've been saying this for years, if, America, if the Constitution is ever, dis, is ever declared the Constitution is null and void, we're no longer under that anymore, we're under this country, we're under this uh, power now, then I will not fight for the Constitution. But for now, I will. I'm for our rights. I'm for standing up for your rights. I don't want to despise my God-given rights by not standing up for them. So anyway, I wanted to sit, make that comment, um, give you that understanding first. And then um, another thing I wanted to, to point out is that, is that last part that we read. He says uh, th why we should do this, uh, that ye may be the children of your father. Why? In the sight of your, of your enemies. So you'll be, so you'll, we are the children of the Father. You don't become, yeah, I don't want anybody to think this is, this leads to work salvation, false doctrine. The devil will turn this in people's minds. Oh, see, if you don't, if you don't do these things, then you're not the children of, of, of your Father. Because it says in verse 43, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. So this is how you become a child of God, is you turn the other cheek, you love your enemies, and you carry stuff, you just do whatever you're told. You submit to all government, and that makes you a child of God. No, we're nobody saved by works. That's a false doctrine. He's telling his disciples that you may be the children of your father. Why? You may be that in the sight of the people you're dealing with that are oppressing you. How are they going to know you're special? That's why he says the difference. If you don't do something different, then even the publicans do this. Even the publicans do that. The tax collectors, the IRS agents, the government people, even they'll greet somebody who greets them. They'll love someone who loves them. Show that then that you're children of your father by being different. By having a love that's not based on how people treat you. That's based on things that you know from heaven's perspective, from God's perspective. So I want to point that out also before we get into the meat of the message. So, I want to, you know, last, last week I preached on how to get right with God and stay right with God. So this morning I want to teach on, preach on how to love your enemies. Because that seems like, that's hard. How do you love your enemies? How do we, it goes totally against our nature. Well, I'm going to give you some illustrations, and I want to explain to you what that really, really means. Because, again, it plays into uh, our lack of knowledge of words and what they mean. So, but this is not going to be new to you, but it's a, it may be a new application for some of you. So, um, let me give you an example. Let me give you a the best example, and then I'll give you another example, but I'll start off with the best example of loving your enemies. Turn to Luke chapter 23, because granted, this is really, really difficult to do. But I'm going to show you how it's not that hard. But it's like, you know, like, like people, people sometimes know they need to, you know, they need to change the oil in their car, but they've never done it. They don't know how to do it. They know they need to do it. And we know that Jesus said, love your enemies. So we, need, we know we need to love our enemies. But how to love our enemies? How do we do that? Well, you have to understand something, just like you have to understand. You've got to know where the oil filter is, where the oil pan is, what kind of oil, and what to do with the old oil, what order to do. And there, there's so many things that, that you need to learn and know before you can change the oil on your your car. And so, so there's a how-to, and I want to help you with how to love your enemies, but you've got to understand all the parts. But let's give, let, let me give you a first an example. All right, turn to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. I'm going to use Jesus as our example. He's the best example. Luke chapter 23. And we'll start with verse 33. Luke 23, 33. This is the story of Jesus being taken and crucified. All right, verse 33. Isn't that funny? We just sang song number 33, Christ arose. Didn't we? Yeah. 
Yeah, we did that today. Okay. All right, verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, that's people that do bad things or make bad things happen, um, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. So here Jesus is being crucified, and he, he's being led out to be crucified, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And last week I preached on how, on, on, on how to get right with God, is first of all recognize that we're alienated from God. We're aliens to Him. So we're aliens or enemies to God. We're enemies in our mind, the Bible says. There, there's an enmity between us and God. The Bible says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So I want to show you how to love your enemies. And Jesus gives an example. He's being led out to be crucified, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, and we know from John 3, 6, so putting together, God so loved the world, and Jesus is God, that he gave his only begotten Son. So he's God, he's also the Son, he's the Father and the Son. One God, manifest in the flesh, he gave himself to pay for our sins because he loves man. He loves everybody. He loves the whole world. Everybody in the world. Everybody who's ever lived, God has loved. He loved the first murderer, Cain. Well, Satan is the first murderer, but anyway, he, he, he loved the first man that murdered. The man that he made in his image, God loved the first murderer that came from Adam, which was his son, Cain. And when you look back in Genesis chapter uh, three, and our, yeah, or chapter four rather, and the story of Cain and Abel, God was trying to get Cain to admit what he was doing. God didn't. God saw. God knew, and God didn't reach down and just kill Cain. In fact, Cain didn't suffer the death penalty. There was no law. God gave a law later that whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. He gave that law to Noah. But, but, but here, in, 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 uh, shortly removed from the garden, Adam and Eve have children, begin having lots of children, and, they, and, and one kills his brother, and God does not put him to death. You know why? Because God loves everybody. He gave that law for us because society would go really bad if we didn't punish sin. If we didn't punish crimes, and, you know, then we're all at risk. So we're actually saving lives that would be murdered by putting to death someone who does not respect the right to life of somebody else. You take away their life, and other people are going to realize, oh, I don't want to die, so they're going to respect everybody else's life. It's a, it's a society-saving law is what it is. It's a life-saving law to put to death murderers um, and adulterers and others. But anyway, so... Uh, now, what I want to point out here... Let me, let me prove to you that this is love. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, he's loving his enemies. And I'm going to give you the secret now, and that you, so you'll understand the other illustra another illustration I'm going to give. Uh, you'll understand that as well. Turn, if you would, please, to the book of Proverbs. I've pointed this out many times before and recently. But I want to do it again in the context of this message, uh, mainly because some may hear this message that never heard the other messages. This could be the first message someone listens to. But um, anyway, look at uh, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 22. How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. I want you to notice in this verse you have love and hate mentioned in the same verse. All right? 
Verse 22, how long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And then the last phrase, and fools hate knowledge. Love and hate are opposites, right? You either love something or you hate something. All right? Now, skip down to verse 28. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Why? For that they hated knowledge. See, fools are supposed to... God says earlier, how long will you hate knowledge? And because he called them, they would not listen. He says, he says, now when you do, because you wouldn't listen to me before, now when you call, I will not answer. Why? Because, or for, that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. So here, hate is defined as, because it's an and, so he's explaining, expanding on what hate is. You didn't hate knowledge, why? Because you did not choose the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the Bible says. Proverbs, I think that's in uh, Proverbs 1, 7. Yeah, look at verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So if you don't choose the fear of the Lord, then you hate knowledge. Because choosing, not choosing, means you hate something. When you choose something, that means you love something. Love and hate is all about choosing or not choosing. I love, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of, I love so many things. <laughs> trying to find out something I love and don't, don't love. Um, okay, as a kid, I loved cheese. But I hated pimento cheese. I didn't like those little red peppers in it. I didn't like those. I hate it. So I would never choose pimento cheese. Never. In fact, one time I got in trouble with my older brother. Mom was off shopping. Mom left us. She fed us, fixed lunch, and then took off shopping and left when my older brother's in charge. And as you've heard me tell this story before, or, or tell this, this, uh, way about our family when, when, of course, dad's at work. So whenever mom and dad were away, they'd always put someone in charge. Usually the oldest would be in charge. I don't know if of any exception to that. But uh, so the oldest at home would be in charge. So I had a particular brother I won't name. I love him dearly, but I remember this. Uh, he was in charge, and dad, they'd done this to other, to other older siblings. Uh, you know, we, we were poor, so we didn't have a lot of money. So we didn't have a choice of what we ate. We had to eat whatever mom fixed. And we had to clean our plate. So my brother, not knowing, put, trying to help, put pimento cheese on a piece of bread. Or maybe on my plate. I guess it was on the side of my plate. And, uh, and, and he noticed I ate everything but that. He said, finish your food. I said, I don't like pimento cheese. Well, he's in charge, and he's the boss now, so finish your food. He wanted to exercise his authority. <laughs> and so he told me, you're going to finish your food, and you can't leave the table until you finish your food. I've heard Dad and Mom tell the same thing to other, for other reasons, uh, other things. And, uh, <laughs> in fact, this brother one time forgot to bring his Bible to the breakfast table. We always have Bible, no Bible, no breakfast. He wouldn't go get his Bible. So Dad made him sit there. We all went to school, and Dad said, you don't get your Bible, you're, gonna, you're, you're, gonna, you're not going to school today. You're going to sit there, I'm going to go to work, and if, if you don't go get your Bible now and read the chapter before I go to work, you're going to sit here till I get home. Right before he left, he said, now son, I'm going to work, and mom's going to enforce what I say. And you be thinking about, when I get home, I want to know whether you want to live. This, is a bro this, this brother is in high school, I believe, at the time. Um, I think he's probably about ninth grade or so. I'm not sure. But anyway, he's in high school. And my dad said, you decide someday, sometime today, you have to decide before I come home whether you're going to abide under my roof, under my authority, and obey my rules. If you don't want to, then you... You can go and get your own place to stay and make your own rules, live however you want to. But as long as you're under my house, you're going to follow my rules. So I want you to think about that, and you cannot leave your chair until I come home. Since you refused, 
you rebelled so far, you stay put until I come home. And when I come home, I want to answer whether you're going to follow the rules or not. Dad went to work. He came home. Oops. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll edit that out. <laughs> um, anyway, so da Dad came home from work. He said, son, have you thought about uh, have you made your decision? And my brother said, yes, I've decided I will obey your rules. So anyway, dad was that away. See, So now that same brother, I don't know which happened first, but, um, but he's making me eat, wants to make me eat my pimento cheese. So I'm like holding my nose. I'm doing everything I know to try to get, and it's just taking me so long, and I just, I just can't do it. And, uh, and I'm still sitting there when mom comes home from her errands, shopping or whatever, and mom rescues me. She, she, she takes over and says, okay, you can leave. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, mom is the one that put it on the plate. And mom had forgot that I, she's in a hurry to go do stuff. She had forgotten that I don't like, she wouldn't have put it on my plate because she knew I didn't like pimento. Now, all that to say, there's a long story to explain, <laughs> uh, I hated pimento. I would never choose it. Now, I also hate celery. But it's not with passion. So here's the thing. Sometimes, okay, if you, if you give me a choice of carrots or celery, I'll always choose carrots. Well, I'd say I used to, would always. Now, I will choose celery because I know it's good for me. But that's because I love me. I love me. I want to be healthy. So I will choose celery sometimes instead of carrots, even though I like the taste of carrots more than celery. But so choose, love means to choose initially. But what happened with love and hate is because emotions go along with decisions we make. You ever make a decision? And, oh, boy, that was a good decision. I'm glad I made that. Gladness comes from the, the fact that you make a good decision. Like a wise son maketh a glad father. When a son makes good decisions, it brings, there's, a, there's a byproduct of that. Okay? And it makes your, your father glad. Um, a foolish son is a heaviness to his mother. And so there's a reaction to that. So we get caught up sometimes in the emotions of life and we don't think about what's really going on. So this is the key to learning how to love your enemies. See, Jesus, when he came to earth, he died for all the sins of the world. He died for everybody. Even those who he knew in his foreknowledge would never believe in him and trust him as Savior. He still chose to die and pay for their sins. So that, even though he knew they would not believe in him, he could then be just when he condemns them to hell and has angels cast them into hell because they refuse to believe. And he offers eternal life and forgiveness to those who believe. He pays. Look, you can't forgive unless you give before. So Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He died in the mind of God. He died before the worlds were even formed and founded. And then he put it into, into history and he actually suffered for our sins and paid for everybody's sins so that he could then say, it's paid for. If you'll believe in me, I will count your faith as righteousness and blot out your sins. He has power to forgive because he gave before. He gave his life, shed his blood for our sins. So God chose to do that because he's no respecter of persons. He chose to die for everybody's sins. Let me give you a verse just in case. There are some people, not necessarily here, that might hear this, that have been taught false doctrine. So let me, let me blow a hole in a false doctrine that gets put out. Turn to 1 John chapter 2. And that is by Calvinists or hyper-Calvinists that believe that Jesus only died for, for, for the people that would believe in him. All right, so let me give it to you straight from the Bible. 1 John chapter 2, 
Verse 1, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he, talking about Jesus, he is the propitiation, that means the, the proper payment, all right, or the payment that was put forth. He is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, those of us who believed, but also for the sins of the whole world. And also in Hebrews 2.9, I think it is, says, or Hebrews 3.9, I forget. To, uh, let me look for that. Let me see if I can spot that real quick. There's another verse that proves it. Um, I think it's 2.9. Yeah, Hebrews 2.9. Another verse my mom made us memorize when we were little kids. But we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. That's why he's made a little lower than the angels. Uh, made, took on the form of flesh. Crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for, what's the last two words? Every man. So he's a propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And he tasted death for every man. Jesus died for everybody. But he chooses, so he chooses to save everybody. That's his choice. But he gives us free will. And he will not force his will on us when he wants someone to be saved. He will not save someone against their will. He will not, he will not cause somebody to be born into his family who does not want who does not believe in him and wants to be born again. So he gave us free will. He will not take it away. So man has the ability to thwart the will of God. See, God is not willing that any should perish. But a lot of people perish. Why? Because God gave us free will. God gave us the ability to choose. He gave us the ability to love and to not love. You can love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength, or you can choose not to love the Lord. You can choose not to choose Him. You can choose the devil or choose your own way. We, like sheep, have gone everyone to, every, everyone turned everyone to his own way. We choose to do our own thing because we have free will. And so this is the secret, learning what love and hate means. Another illustration. The Bible says that God loved Jacob, hated Esau. Did God, uh, can't stand Esau. No. God just didn't choose Esau. Esau was the firstborn. God did not choose Esau to be the lineage through which Christ would be born. God chose Jacob. Why? Because Esau despised his birthright. That's why God hated Esau, hating not with emotion, because God blessed Esau. When Jacob when met Esau, many years later, at last Jacob knew that Esau wanted to kill him, <laughs> threatened to kill him, and so when Jacob heard that they're, they're passing through Edom, he sent a bunch of gifts and, and his family or, and his servants and, to impress Esau, and with a gift, just in case he still wanted to kill him, and maybe he could buy his life back. But Esau had gotten over it. He's no longer bitter about Jacob cheating him out of his uh, birthright and so forth, or selling his birthright. He actually sold his birthright. But he, did, he got over that, and he got over the fact that, that uh, Jacob had cheated him out of the blessing from his father, which I don't have time to go into that story. So Jacob and Esau got back together, and Jacob noticed. He, and, and Esau said, look, I don't need all these gifts from you. God has blessed me. See, God didn't hate Esau with a passion. He just didn't choose Esau to be the one through whom Christ would come into the world. He chose Jacob. He loved Jacob. Now the emotion. Let me tell you something. There's a bunch of people who can get emotional out there. If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're looking, oh, there's nobody here looking except Blake maybe. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but, but young people that are looking for uh, a, a marriage partner, a husband or a wife, man, this world, what does the devil do? Appeals to emotions. Why? Because the world and the devil does not want you to have a solid marriage. They want you to get caught up in romance and feelings and all that instead of making a decision about what's good. 
what's good and what's best and what's wise and who would be a good wife, who would be a good husband, who will take care of you, who will, who will help you. Those things usually don't enter young people's minds. They, it's all about beauty and looks and sometimes about money and sometimes about prestige. That didn't matter. In fact, in fact, back in the old days, in Bible days, people chose their children's mates. They chose. Parents chose a lot of times. We think of that, oh, that's terrible, because we've been brainwashed into emotions. See? So, so, likewise, how can anybody love your enemy? Oh, man, I hate him for what he did. I can't. Huh. Oh, oh, you want them to go to hell? Some people actually will say yes to that. <laughs> there are some people that call themselves Christians. If you disagree with them doctrinally, they'll say, I want you to go to I can't wait for you to go into hell. You're wrong and can't wait to see you burn in hell. You're not saved. You're a reprobate because you're wrong on this doctrine or whatever. Those folks, they don't know how to love. They don't know what love is. Love means to choose. And God's not willing that should any, anybody should perish. Why should we be willing for anyone to perish? When I go soul winning, I'm not wanting anybody. I don't, there's, I don't care how bad someone treats me. I don't care if they cuss me off. I don't care if they slam the door in my face, which doesn't happen rarely. It's, you know, don't not go soul because you're scared of that. It rarely happens. I mean, have you ever seen anybody slam the door in my face? I don't remember. Now, some closed fairly, fairly quickly, but no one's ever slammed it. Said, now, now, we've been cussed, you know. Um, we've had people that not, not want us. But you know what? I still would rather they get saved and go to heaven. You know why? Because I have a heart. The love of God, the choosing of God, the choices of God are shed abroad in our hearts. Not just emotions. His choice. The will of God is what I want. I want the will of God. So I want you to be best. I don't, I don't preach to entertain you, to make you feel good. I preach to give you truths that you can sink your teeth in and know and have knowledge of God and have the fear of God and to choose the fear of God and choose knowledge and choose to live the Bible way. Because that's what love really is, is when you choose what's best. See? And truth is best. So, the way we love our enemies is we choose for them to be saved. So Jesus on the cross, no, before he got on the cross, he's going up the hill and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He is choosing that God forgives their sins. And guess what? Because his desire is the same as God's, because, well, he is God, but he's in two places now at the same time. Um, God's will was done. You can read about it in Acts chapter 2. Because Peter says, This Jesus, whom God hath raised up, ye have delivered, and by the determinate counsel of foreknowledge of God, have, by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up. Peter preached the truth to the Jews who 50 days earlier were in the crowd saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And, and the Spirit of God was in Peter and all the disciples. And as they preached, they preached the truth. Why? So these people would realize how much God loved them. And when they realized that they had crucified the Messiah, because Peter proved from the Bible, the Old Testament, that Jesus was the Messiah, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent. Change your thinking. You believe he's a blasphemy for saying he's God. He is God. Change your mind. Believe the scriptures. He is that one that David spoke of. Who said in Psalm 16. Thou will not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou serve thine holy one to seek corruption. So Peter just said. Change your mind. Change what you believe. Choose to believe the scriptures I just preached to you instead of the tradition of, oh, a man claims to be God, he should be put to death. Yeah, if he's not God, but Jesus is God. You didn't know it, you need to change your mind. And if you'll change your mind and believe and choose to believe that Jesus is who I just preached to you of who he is and what the scriptures say, 
then God will forgive your sins. And so the Bible says that, that uh, in Acts chapter 2, I think verse 42, uh, as that, that uh, let's see, got the, I should have it memorized. Um, and they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day, God added, them about three, added to them 3,000 souls. So 3,000 Jews that hated Jesus had said, crucify him, crucify him to Pilate 50 days earlier, are now believing on the Lord. They changed their mind and they trusted Christ as their Savior, believed that he was their Savior. And they got saved. And they gladly received that good news. Because it is good news. Why? Because God loves sinners. God has chosen to save sinners. That's all there are. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God has chosen to save sinners. So if God can choose to save us when we've been done wrong, then we can choose for God to forgive people who treat us wrong. We have to check our emotions because it's tough. But deep down in our heart, we can choose for God to give them forgiveness. For God to bring them to repentance. Not just for what they do to us, but what they're doing to God. Because whatever they do to us, they're doing to one of God's children. See, So it's God they're sinning against, not so much us. Remember David in Psalm 51, when he confessed his sin? After Nathan the prophet came and said, Thou art the man. And... Uh, and let David know that he was guilty of adultery and murder. David said in Psalm 51, verse 4, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. See, all of our sins are actually against God. Because what does it matter if you sin against someone who's, who's sinned against God is going to go to hell? It doesn't matter. If we're going to go to hell, that doesn't matter what people do to us. But if we were going to go to hell and we get saved, it still doesn't matter what they do to us. We should tell them about the forgiveness we've gotten so that they can get it for what they've done to us or to God through us. You see what I'm saying? So that helps us. That's how to love your enemies. By getting, don't live by emotion. Live by free will and choose the will of God. God wants someone who mistreats you. He chose them. He wants them to be saved. They don't know. So as a sinner, yeah, they're going to do wrong. And sometimes you might have to bear some of the wrong, but Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree. Why can't we bear whatever someone does to us? Says or does. I don't care if, if, even if they kill us. So what? We're going to heaven? Why would we get mad at someone for taking us, sending us to heaven? <laughs> so we don't have to put up with anything in this world. Why would we get upset about that? Now, we should be upset and that it's wrong and that's not the way society should live. And so the laws are, are designed to help a society stay clean and stay decent towards one another. But don't take things so personally. We all tend to take things personally. Our feelings get hurt. And therefore, we act like we hate each other because we don't choose. We choose ourselves. Oh, my feelings hurt, so we're choosing ourselves rather than them. So how do you love your enemy? Choose the best for others. That's why the Bible means by in honor, preferring other better than esteeming other better than himself. Let's honor other people instead of trying to get honor for ourselves and want people to treat us certain because we're special. We're not special. We're sinners deserving of hell. That by the grace of God, we've heard the wondrous message of, of salvation and we have obtained mercy. And the person who's doing us wrong hasn't attained mercy. They're in worse shape than us. So do good in them. Pray for them that despitefully use you. Because they're headed for hell. And you're not, even though you deserve it just as much as they do. See what I'm saying? Don't get caught up in the emotions. Choose the will of God. Choose that no one perish. Choose that that person that despitefully uses you that curses you and says all manner of evil again, choose for them to get saved and to hear the gospel. And therefore, bear whatever you've got to bear in order to show them that you're different. You're not like the publicans. Because even the publicans are nice to those who are nice to them. And even publicans will lash out at people who lash out at them. Let's show that we're different. And let's choose 
the will of God for everybody. Let me give you another example. Turn to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. See, it, it'd be impossible pretty much to have the right emotions all the time. That's why we have to rule our own spirit. See, greater is he that hath, who ruleth his own spirit than he that taketh the city. Any general can go to war. It's, all right, just let him have it. It doesn't matter. Kill him. If you, if you miss their heart and hit their lungs and, and they bleed to death, choke to death slowly, that's okay. It's war. All's fair in love and war. That's just, well, all's fair in emotional romance and love when, when you're trying to get some woman to steal from some woman from some other man. Anyway, there, there's no rules in war. You just fight. You kill as many as you can and however you can. It doesn't matter. But man, when we're in spiritual warfare, it does matter what we do. We've got to live right. All right, Acts chapter 7. Let me get there. Here you have uh, Stephen, one of, uh, one of the, the seven that was chosen um, to serve tables. And one of the things, one of the requirements to serve in the church is to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And the power of the Holy Ghost is given to preach the gospel. So Stephen's a soul winner and he's a preacher. But he's not a pastor. He's just a, uh, a deacon in the church, you might say. And one of those seven that was chosen. Look at verse 8. Acts chapter 7, verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned... Oh, I'm sorry, this is chapter 6. You're looking all over chapter 7. I'm sorry. I, I went... I, I was thinking chapter 7 is over here, but I got bifocals on. Anyway, so I thought it was in 7, but this chap, that's chapter 6. So that's just background. They stirred up the people. And... Uh, and, yeah, this, this is how it starts. They stirred up the people, verse 12 of chapter 6. And the elders and the scribes and, and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place in the law. Doing to him just like they did to Jesus, bringing up false witnesses. Why? They can't stand his preaching. He's preaching the gospel. All right? So they give him, they give him the ability to, to stand and speak before the council. Verse 15 says, And all that sat in the council stood, uh, or looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. And then, the, verse 1 of chapter 7, Then said the high priest, Are these things so? Those what the false witnesses accuse him of. Are these things so? And he said, Men and brethren and fathers, hearken. And then he begins to go through history and talk about God dealing with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the history of the Israelites. So he preaches a long sermon, explains to them some things, and then he shows how that, verse 48, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? He's proven to these people who put great stock in the temple because they're accusing him of, of blasphemy, speaking against the temple and against, against, uh, uh, yeah, against the whole place of the law. Yeah, against the word of God, against the laws. And, of course, the law in their mind is the law and all the commandments, they've, the commandments of men that were added to it. But anyway, so they, they are, that's what they're charging Stephen with. But now look at the next verse. He says, verse 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, did, as your fathers did so do ye. And, uh, and then, look at verse 54, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. 
Oh, they didn't like that. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet named, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down while stones are raining on him. He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, or he died. So Stephen, when, while he's being stoned, he said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. What was he doing? He's loving these people. He doesn't want them to go to hell. He doesn't want God to charge them with with, with stoning him. He's saying, God, forgive them, just in different words. He's choosing the will of God for these people, his enemies. See, his choice is not based on how he feels, because guess what? It don't feel good to have people yelling at you, gnashing on you with your teeth, and, 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 and despising you, and hating you, and picking up stones, and trying to bash your brains out, and, and, and hurt you. That doesn't feel good. No one's going to choose that. But he's choosing their salvation. He's loving his enemies. Obviously, they're his enemies. <laughs> they're fighting against him, warning against him, trying to kill him. See? So I'm, I'm showing you how to do it. It's not, you're not going to do it by emotions. You cannot love with emotions. You can, you can have emotions while you love, but you cannot love with emotions. The emotions are not the cause. They're the after effect. They're the byproduct. You know, when you know, like I remember I, my wife accidentally used some scrap paper that she'd written, or maybe she's, I don't know. Anyway, she'd uh, used some black paper, construction paper, on the back of a card she made to me, where she just sent me something, I forget what it was off the top of my head. I just remember what, I, I was reading in the light of the chapel. Uh, I was checking up on, on ladies that worked for me, that cleaning the chapel. And, uh, and I was looking at this, I just got it from her in the mail, and, and, and the light shone in such a way, I saw something bright along the edge of the back of the card. And I looked at it, oh, there's writing in there, oh, you can't see it. And I looked at it, what, what is that? It looked like an and sign. And I thought, oh. So it was right in the middle of, of one of the edges, so I looked in the middle of another edge, and I saw the word love. Oh, I turned to the other one, it said you. I turned back to that, what I thought was an and sign, oh, that's an I, capital I, written cursive. I love you. Oh, she's secretly telling me she didn't make it plain. Oh, I got so excited. But you know, she chose to wrote that, to write that. And I just saw that and the impact of her decision had an emotional impact on me. Now, I already decided that I loved her. I just hadn't told her yet. So it was March that I told her that I loved her. So anyway, but she hadn't told me back, apparently. But anyway, so I thought, oh, she's, she's playing with the idea in her mind. She does. She just hasn't told me yet. Anyway, I got excited. Now, the choice, I'd already made my choice. I already decided I wanted to marry her. I hadn't asked her yet, but I already made my choice. I love her. I chose her for all the other girls in college. And a lot of really good girls there. Loved God good attributes, spiritual attributes, and so forth, the things that are most important. But I had chosen her. She had not told me yet that she would chose her, but when I saw that, oh, I got excited. See, the emotion came. But, you know, our marriage isn't built on emotion. It's built on facts and choices that we make. So, anyway, uh, so I'm, I'm, again, I'm trying to teach you how. It's impossible. If you do it by emotions, you're never going to succeed. But we can love our enemies if we choose the best for them. There's nobody that I want to go to hell, no matter what kind of atrocities they commit. Because it's forever. It's forever. God has not chosen anybody to go to hell. He's chosen to save everybody, but he gave us free will, and for him to negate our free will by force means that we don't have free will. 
and the gifts and calling to God are without repentance. God will not change his mind as, as much emotionally as he would. He, he'd hate that people are, don't choose him. He has to stick with his choice. Because if you don't give people free will, they are your slaves. If you give them free will, they can choose to serve you out of love. And that's a great relationship. But, you know, master and robot, that's not a good relationship. Not much emotion is going to come from that, except excitement. I made this and pride. God wants, he knows the joy of making a good choice, and he wants us to enjoy that, but at risk of making bad choices. But the creature was made, we were made subject to vanity in hope, in hope. So that's how you love your enemies. You choose God's will for them. Let me give you one more illustration. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. This is amazing to me. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. All right. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. So he's got ten children. It goes on and explains his, his wealth there in verse 3. Now verse 4. Um, and his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day. Maybe that's birthday. They they. Have a party at one son's house and then on his birthday, then go to another son's on his birthday. They, they're just having lots of parties and feasting. And you know, when you feast and party, you can get carried away, and pretty soon you're, you're, you're appealing to your flesh. And, and so he's a little bit concerned. So verse 5, And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about, not done with, but gone about, they're, they're, they're in the process of doing this, that maybe they all had birthdays fairly close together. I don't know. Anyway, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. See, while his, his children are partying and all that, he's sanctified, setting them apart, marking them for God's sake and offering sacrifices on their behalf. Because in his heart he's saying, maybe they have sinned. Maybe while they're parting, they're doing some things that aren't right. Oh, God, please forgive their sins. God, Job is choosing the will of God for his children. Now, they have to make their own choice, obviously. But it just shows that God, that, 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 how parents should be. Parents should choose the will of God for their children and choose the best and desire the best. And that's why we pray for our children. That's why we, 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 we spank and, uh, and uh, um, we don't spare the rod on our children. Why? Because we choose for them to turn out good. And if they never learn uh, while, they're little, while they're little how the, the danger and the, the, the pain that comes from doing wrong when they're little, then they'll never learn and they'll do, suffer great pain when they commit crimes later on as an adult. So we should choose. A lot of people don't love their children because they think it's all about emotion. They get emotion about their children, but they don't choose what's best for their children because they don't understand love. Oh, I love my child, the mother says, as she goes down to the welfare office to cash another, get another welfare check or a father or whatever the case may be. I mean, look, if you love your children, you set a good example, and you train them how to be a, a good adult, a good man, a good woman. It's not about emotion. If it's about emotion, you're going to ruin your children's lives. And if a pastor cares about how people feel about him, he's going to ruin their lives because he won't preach the truth. So I'm trying to help you to love your enemies. And, it's, and by the way, it's how you love God. You choose God's will over your own. You say, okay, God, help me with this sin, instead of trying to uh, rationalize it and find some way. Well, everybody does it, so it must not be so bad. I'm just going to wallow in the grace of God. Shall we, shall we sin the grace of abound? God forbid. No, don't just give up. 
fight against sin. Resist temptation and fight the devil and fight the flesh. Fight your own will and submit yourself to the will of God because you choose God. You choose His will. Because if you live by emotion, it's going to wreck and ruin your life. You're going to make lots of bad decisions. So, and also, you're not going to be able to love your enemies. You won't be able to do what Jesus said because you're going to be all emotional. So choose your enemies. Let's choose for everybody. When someone uh, cuts you off on the freeway, don't honk at them and cuss at them. Don't, don't treat them wrong. Say, Lord, that guy's in a hurry. And he's not rude. He's not even thinking about it. He's thinking about himself. Lord, help him to think about himself enough to where he wonders where he's going to go when he die. Choose the will of God. Let's ask God to help us to have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which also is in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You know why? Because he so loved the world. He chose to save us rather than condemn us. But because he gave us free will, we will then force him to condemn us someday if we do not believe on him. So let's do the will of God. Let's choose knowledge. Let's choose righteousness. Let's choose God. Let's choose his will. And let's give up our will. Let me close with this. Um, Romans 12, uh, 12, 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that's the base of which I'm beseeching or begging you. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world where you live by your emotions. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So let's choose God's will in, in our lives. And let's not live by emotions. Enjoy emotions when they're enjoyable. Bear them when they're not enjoyable. But choose the will of God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you give us wisdom to understand these things. And Lord, I pray that you give us lasting wisdom. I pray that you cause this message to linger in our hearts in our minds and, and find a home and because we, we see so clearly in the moment the Lord help it to affect us help, us to st help it to stick with us so that when we have decisions to make we can use this as a way mark to make a decision not on emotion but on the will of your will and what you want bless us we pray with good memories and good instincts because this point has been put in us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.